thing for the civil society of Pakistan to overcome. I mean, I, one can't legislate on that in any way. Afghanistan is an obstacle. Kashmir is an obstacle. Uh, the whole, the whole concept of uh, of arming of each other, our militaries, is an obstacle. The Punjab-based groups are a major obstacle. Let's not wish away all this. This is all there. So, and I may have brought a smile to the face in the beginning, but let's get serious. And these are issues which you cannot wish away. And if you want our trade and relationship to go forward, or we obviously have to deal with all this and mature civil societies are known to deal with all this. Otherwise, what will happen is that an economic asymmetry will emerge in the subcontinent to such an extent. Because I can assure you, with the kind of stability that India has found today, political stability, with the kind of leadership that India has found today, uh, 10 years later, I can envisage, without any political bias, to say that India will be 10 feet tall. And if Pakistan doesn't get its act together, it may not. That asymmetry will be there, which will not be a very good thing for relationships even at that time. So we need to have a strong Pakistan. We need a stable Pakistan. We need economically very strong Pakistan to make sure that this relationship continues to drive. Uh, last bit. I was in Kashmir when the initial opening of the LOC trade started. I was the GOC at Baramula at that time when the first vehicles went across. It's surprising that from 2008 till 2015, seven years, the operationalization, or should I say the maturity or maturing of that uh, trade has not taken place. It was supposed to be setting the trend and supposed to be the, the <coughs> initiator for trade relations between India and Pakistan. And it was supposed to be come by join or bringing up a little more uh, symmetry between the other two sides of Kashmir. But it's not grown because of uh, officialdom, intelligence, security-driven perspectives. We've not been able to get our act together on this at all. And that's exactly what is going to happen here. If, if, we, if, we, if we don't get our protocols right and we get driven by security establishments and things like that, you will never progress beyond what you speak and, and discuss here. I think I've taken more than my time. And I would only, I would only recommend, finally, that for such relationships, Perhaps black and white is the wor are the worst colors. Don't ever look. Don't ever look at this is right and this is wrong. The ambiguity is the is the finest thing. middle path, and ambiguity is the finest thing. Leave aside all this plus deficit, etc. Just go ahead. I think economists finally will actually rule the roost and bring peace between India and Pakistan. Thank you very much. Thank you, General Sir, for bringing both the smile as well as common sense to this audience. I have only one question for you. You very rightly pointed out that economics drives security, and then security drives economics. We hear that both in Pakistan and India, that at this moment, and for the last 67 years, security and politics have been the obstacle in economics. Can we just start a new paradigm where we build up the economic relations in order to diffuse the tensions and reduce the mistrust which exists between the two countries and create constituencies in each other's countries which will ensure that both the considerations of security and politics are minimized. We don't want to do away with the political disputes. They are. China and India are very good examples. You have political disputes, but you have a $75 billion of bilateral trade between the two countries. Taiwan and China are not great friends, but they are the largest single trader partners and investment. Why can't we learn lessons from others and try to change the paradigm and give a chance to better economic relations? That's the question I pose to my Pakistani friends, and I want to do that same to you. Well, next speaker is quite well known in, Pakistan, in India, uh, Dr. Akbar Zedi. And I will only add that he is our adjunct professor at the Institute of Business Administration. Akbar. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shizusan. Um, I'm very grateful to Nisha Taneja, Professor Nisha Taneja, for inviting me to this conference. 
I think Nisha is the most outstanding economist on India-Pakistan affairs, relationships, uh, um, anywhere in the world, not just in India. And I have learned a great deal from her work over the last 20 years or so, and I've been following her work. And I, one cannot uh, talk about India and Pakistan without citing Nisha's work. Um, there's been a lot of work and a lot of talk about India and Pakistan trade relations. Um, it's, it's understood that that's how people are supposed to look at both states. Increasingly, there's been work on Punjab and Punjab, I mean, this new bhaichara that one Punjab has found with the other. Uh, my paper is limited. It talks about Mumbai and Karachi, uh, something that has been ignored in the literature. And I did this work for Gateway House uh, from where the next speaker comes from. So it's work which I've worked, uh, some, some data and things that I've looked at. But I'm going to just draw some broad points which emerge from this, uh, this research that I did. <clears throat> it is 20 years now since the Deputy High Commission in, in, uh, of India in Karachi was closed down. It closed down in November 1994 due to political disturbances in Karachi. There have been at least two attempts to open the Deputy High Commission in Karachi, but they have both failed. And now we have an abandoned building in a very nice part of Karachi, which uh, lies closed. Um, the consequence of that was that people from Karachi who want to travel to India, especially to Mumbai, until the electronic visa system was established in 2012, had to travel to Islamabad to get their visas. And that cost about the same amount as a flight from Karachi to Mumbai. So by the closer, closing of the uh, high, Deputy High Commission in Karachi, the people of <coughs> Karachi suffer, uh, suffered a great deal. Prior to 2008, and I think the, the turning point is the, the Mumbai attacks of 2008. Prior to 2008, there were as many as five direct PIA flights between Karachi and Mumbai a week, a trip which takes only 90 minutes. There were also three direct Air Lanka flights every week. Today, there is only one direct flight between Karachi and Mumbai. There used to be four flights between Lahore and uh, New Delhi every week. Now there is only one. There used to be three flights between Karachi and New Delhi every week. Now there is only one. The flight and the time that Mr. Majid Aziz and I took yesterday to get to, uh, from Karachi to New Delhi took 17 hours. It's a long story. This flight should take one hour, 45 minutes, about the same time that it takes from Karachi to Islamabad. It's about more or less the same as New Delhi. The biggest loser in this, surprisingly, has been PIA. Of course, the people of Karachi and perhaps Mumbai and Karachi, uh, Pakistan and India as well. But PIA has, has suffered a great deal because of the loss of the route, which uh, allowed a lot of immigrants, migrants, workers in the Middle East to come to India. And PIA had competitive fares, and they used to, they used to use these flights a great deal. These very simple and you know, sort of uh, top of the list facts highlight a mere iota of the hundreds of small and large issues which affect India-Pakistan and as a conse consequence Mumbai-Karachi relations. If there is one consensus in Pakistan, I think more so than in India, it is that it is Pakistan rather than India which has suffered the significantly from the absence of economic and trade relations between the two countries. While the Punjab-Punjab Bonhomie over the last five years may have changed the relationship between Lahore and New Delhi, Lahore, Amritsar, Ludhiana, Chandigarh, and so on, Mumbai, Karachi, and particularly Karachi, have been the biggest losers. The Mumbai, Karachi relationship in terms of trade, economic cooperation, travel, visas, and other forms of communication is heavily constrained and determined by the India-Pakistan relationship. Uh, when visas are not issued, or flights not operational, or just a handful of goods are on the positive list to be traded, all of Pakistan suffers, but particularly Mumbai and Karachi. There's been a lot of talk, but very little action. There's the joint, the Bombay-Karachi uh, Joint Chamber of Commerce and Industry, which was set up in 2011, but all they do is sponsor delegations. They don't do very much uh, else. There was talk, I think, when Isha Saab was the uh, State Bank governor as well at that time, of opening branches between India and Pakistan. I think something that's very important. But they have agreed to open branches in each other's country on a, countries on a reciprocal basis. There has been little progress on the ground. It was proposed, now it, it, I'm, I'm not sure whether this proposal is still considered, that instead of opening full-fledged bank branches, the two countries might allow their banks to open representative offices across the border. 
Representative offices do not engage in the business of bank banking, but act only as liaison and marketing offices and can be set up at a minimal cost. But they do not really provide the banking services which businessmen in Karachi and Mumbai and other places would, uh, would, would require. While the, while the Lahore, and New, uh, Lahore and New Delhi and Lahore and Chandigarh and uh, Amritsar relationships have been developed, I'm going to try and look at the relationship between Mumbai and Karachi. <coughs> Karachi is the economic, financial, manufacturing, commercial and human capital head of Pakistan. It, it is the most dynamic and developed metropolis in Pakistan and has numerous advantage, advantages compared to other cities. There are lots of problems as well, but let's just highlight some of the advantages that Karachi has. And a Karachi-Mumbai relationship is not limited to Karachi-Mumbai. If a relationship between Karachi and Mumbai is developed, it opens up the south of India for, for Karachi and for the rest of Pakistan. It allows access to Bangalore, Chennai, and other parts uh, as well. So I think that's a very important uh, aspect for, which one looks, uh, needs to look at. While the northern corridor between Lahore, New Delhi, Lahore, Amritsar, and so on, so opens up uh, from Punjab to Punjab to Chandigarh to Haryana and uh, to New Delhi, the southern Karachi-Mumbai axis opens up much more of India for people in the south of India, uh, Pakistan uh, as well. So the most important thing that needs to be done if one is to move forward is to have consulates in both megapolises. Without consul mm -hmm. consulates opening in Mumbai and Karachi, one cannot talk of a Mumbai-Karachi relationship. It's just not going to work. One needs to increase flights and increase airlines. Both countries have opened their aviation industry to private airlines and should allow both to fly to many cities in both countries rather than the very few they do. I mean, just Karachi and Lahore have one flight a week with New Delhi or Bombay. Uh, there's no direct flight with Islamabad and Karachi is not linked to other places. One has to go to, through the Middle East to get to anywhere else. Medical tourism is now a growing business in, in, in India and particularly in the south of, south of India. Mumbai and through it the south of India need to access the large potential of patients who are likely to make use of better medical facilities in India. With very high incomes in Karachi, Karachi's per capita income is probably twice or three times that of the rest of Pakistan. There is an opportunity to tap into that market. There's been talk of linking the two dynamic stock exchanges, the Bombay Stock Exchange and the Karachi Stock Exchange, and there's just talk. As I said, there's a lot of talk, but very little development taking place. There used to be a ferry service between Karachi and Mumbai <coughs> until 1965. And perhaps there's a need to look at how one can revive that ferry service, especially because it's going to be used for cargo, it's going to be used for people where the price of uh, the ferry service is going to be cheaper than the flight between Karachi and Mumbai. Tourism is something that you know, a lot of people in the Punjab talk about. The Punjab, Pakistani Punjab want to go to Ludhiana, Amritsar, and Chandigarh, and vice versa. I mean, there's a lot of uh, relationship developed over there. And this, there's a euphoria on the Punjab-Punjab relationship. In fact, I think Salman Shah, before he became finance minister, wrote an article about how much money would be spent by uh, the Punjabi, Punjabis who came from India to Pakistan and how good that would be for Pakistan's economy. Uh, Karachi has numerous communities who have interests and relatives in Mumbai. Different ethnic groups would travel far more frequently given their roots and relatives in Mumbai and Gujarat. The Bohris, the Ismailis, the Kachis, the Maiman, the Gujarati communities in Karachi and the rest of Sindh have had their historical links broken due to visa restrictions and political issues. Ease in travel will allow such groups to interact and also to explore business possibilities. Every single day in Pakistan, in, especially in Karachi, one hears about uh, the number of fisher folk who have been arrested from the, 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 the waters near at Karachi. And similarly, one hears of fisher folks who are arrested in Mumbai and Gujarat and other parts. Perhaps there's a need to have a policy or some joint ventures between those who, those who sort of ship in the same, who fish in the same waters in the, in the Arabian Gulf. There's a joint and need for a joint and mutual urban development and renewal program between Mumbai and Karachi. With 50 million people, Karachi has about 22, 23 million people. I think Greater Bombay has about more or less the same. With 50 million people across a distance of 500 nautical miles, there are many similarities between the urban growth and re renewal in the two metropolises. Both cities are multi-ethnic, cosmopolitan, and are often compared to each other and found to be similar. They could develop urban forums to learn about problems and solutions which affect each other, 
and range from issues of traffic, pollution, water, housing, and low-income settlements. Just the Mumbai-Karachi city-to-city agenda can link both cities for decades to come because the problems are fairly similar in many ways. So another important point is that there's very little information about <coughs> Mumbai or Karachi in, in, in reciprocal cities. There is an imagined view of how Indians see Pakistan and how Pakistanis see India, but that's a very imagined view. When Pakistanis come to India, they see a very different India, and when Indians come to Pakistan, they're shocked. They didn't think it would be like this. And I think the same sort of relation, uh, same sort of image exists between Mumbai and Karachi as well. So there's a great need for information sharing and for you know, some research to take place and different interest groups to emerge. I'll conclude with a few broad points. I think it is an injustice of history that two of the most dynamic and largest me megap megapolises in South Asia, perhaps in the world, with such close proximity to each other, not just in terms of actual distance, 447 nautical miles, that's about all, or a flight time of about 75 minutes with close common cultural and historical roots for so many decades have been kept so far apart. Given so many similarities, both could have grown together in a closely integrated and interconnected manner in the new world economy, which all of us talk so much about, where such linkages are increasingly common, where even distances are less of an obstacle. Both Mumbai, but I think especially Karachi, have lost out on the such close joint potential following the boom in the economy in India in the 1990s and in Pakistan in the, 19, in the, in the, early, in the late 1990s and the 2000s. Closer collaboration between the two cities could have addressed very similar problems across both cities. Nevertheless, while much has been lost over the last four decades, the present does offer new and creative possibilities to make amends and to take advantages of new technologies and solutions. As New Delhi and Islamabad hopefully sort out their many problems cutting through red tape, Mumbai and Karachi need to prepare for the moment where collaboration and integration become a reality. I'll end with just one small point, and I think that we can talk as much as we want about increasing trade between India and Pakistan. But there are three things, three minor things, if they could be done, we don't need to do anything else. Better, easier, accessible visas, more flights, and access on, te on telephones, roaming. I mean, all Pakistanis who are here, are unable to access their phones. Uh, if there was better roaming, better telecommunication systems, more flights and more visas were available, I think the India-Pakistan trade problem would be solved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Akbar. You very ably summarized the three suggestions, which I think will make a lot of difference. And thank you for disaggregating the larger macro picture by linking the Mumbai Karachi uh, relationship and I think that is something which can be done because after all sin was part of Bombay presidency before partition so there are very strong historical links between the two places our last speaker is uh, professor Neelam Deo she is the director at the Gateway House but before that she had a very distinguished career in the Indian Foreign Service having been ambassador to Denmark and Ivory Coast and many other places. So, Dr. Deo. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, a disclaimer, I'm neither a professor nor a doctor, but I was a former Foreign Service officer. Uh, one of the big uh, problems of, or maybe the advantages of being the last speaker is that all the sensible things have been said already. And my only job now is to not uh, repeat what has been said. Um, I'm also actually uh, not going to talk uh, very much specifically about uh, India and Pakistan trade. Uh, I, I, I think the advantages of uh, trade are self-evident. And in my uh, personal experience, I dealt with both Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, Myanmar, and Maldives. And uh, you know, we reviewed the trade agreements. We worked on the FTAs, on the on the SICAs, um, and I found that uh, while the actual negotiations were were uh, could be very problematic uh, as as officials, 
But in fact, the existence of the trade and its increases and its potential actually helped uh, to keep the relationship at the political level and at other levels um, more uh, amicable. Uh, but I, what I'm actually going to do is to invite uh, you to look at the benefits of trade really by looking at China uh, rather than at our own uh, more troubled uh, setup. Now, what, uh, what we have to do uh, with China is to look at how it has leveraged trade with various, with all its neighbors and uh, the benefits that it has <coughs> derived from that. Uh, the first and most obvious, of course, is that China itself has grown dramatically and its growth is based on trade. It's, a, it's the largest trading nation ever. It has become a magnet, an economic magnet for all of its neighbors. And this is very important because it also has a maritime or boundary disputes with all these neighbors. But those disputes it has, have been contained in a certain, at a certain level uh, because the economic interdependency has underpinned these relationships. So at the same time, even more importantly, uh, the, the rivalry with the United States has also been contained because of the trade relationship and the fact that it holds such huge foreign exchange reserves and uh, US Treasury bills. Now, here it's important to note that China was able to increase its trade with neighbors and particularly, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the land neighbors. Either after it had settled the boundary dispute, and if you look at the China-Russia, uh, you know that before the border agreement was signed, the trade was less than $10 billion. Now it's close to $100 <coughs> billion. And, it is, and that is when we are not even looking at the gas pipelines and the gas agreements that have now been uh, signed more recently post the Ukraine affair. Similarly, with, a, with Kazakhstan, it has been able to become the largest buyer of gas from Kazakhstan after settling the boundary dispute. And that has also enabled it to access the energy resources from other Central Asian countries. So, but on the other hand, it has also expanded its relationship hugely with Taiwan, which was mentioned earlier, and say Japan. But those were done by, in a way, setting aside the boundary and other political disputes. You would remember that uh, Deng had this uh, phrase of where you, you know, keep your strength hidden until you are ready to display it. Uh, so except with India, where the border dispute has continued to be uneasy, even if it is peaceful, uh, there was no talk of the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands dispute until Japan had invested billions of dollars into China and the trade is what, $300 billion uh, annually. So there is something to look at uh, over there. I think India and Pakistan cannot follow that example because we are both democracies, our politics doesn't allow it, and the media absolutely does not allow it. <coughs> but it needs to be noted that there is, you can do trade both ways, before concluding your border agreement or making that, uh, you know, the issue afterwards. Now. The other point I want to make is that in the Indian case, the fact that India-Pakistan trade has not really gone up substantially, even if the informal trade is larger, uh, etc. That was also the case with Bangladesh uh, when we were working on uh, trade with Bangladesh, where uh, the informal trade was more than, more than what the formal trade was. But uh, once we got an FTA with Sri Lanka, it's interesting that trade with Sri Lanka is five, million, five billion dollars, a country with 20 million people. Uh, whereas trade with uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh together is just over five billion dollars considering the size of the populations and the fact that there are land borders which you think could promote the trade. But the difficulties in this, in, these, in this bilateral relationship and the failure uh, to a great extent of SARC, um, with my apologies to Ajay, and of SAFTA, are actually causing India to look eastward uh, for global reasons, but also just for local reasons. Uh, and it is becoming very embedded in the architecture on the east. So you have 
the economic uh, vibrancy of China, first of all, but also of ASEAN, of Japan, of uh, Korea, all the other countries with which, uh, which are pulling, which have become the magnet on that side. For India to look east, other reasons, of course, there's a whole range of reasons. The rise and expansionism of China itself is something that pulls the attention of the political establishment, but also the administrative uh, capacity of the country with the pressure on our border with China. Then, you know, Japan, Australia, Korea, ASEAN, all of these are countries which welcome India to come in as a balancer into the eastern side, whether as for strategic reasons, but also for economic reasons. You know, some years ago, I think the then Prime Minister of uh, Singapore, and maybe uh, Professor Muni will correct me on this, had said that ASEAN is a jumbo jet and China is one wing and India is potentially the other wing. So India is being welcomed into that region. Uh, for India, for its own commerce, the need to protect the sea lanes of, of commerce, all of those issues are themselves uh, important. Then there are mo even more local reasons. In order to rectify the neglect of our northeastern states, India needs to look east. The relationship with Bangladesh has improved qualitatively, and the importance of Myanmar has also gone up a great deal, and that too is pulling India eastwards. And finally, in this most recent uh, visit of the American president, uh, there has been a reset of the relationship, uh, but we have signed uh, an agreement. There is a joint strategic vision for the Asia Pacific and the Indian Ocean. And clearly the expectation is that there will be more things that India and the United States will be doing together towards its east. Now this is, uh, you know, in a way uh, it's, a, it's a kind of caution because all of us have fairly limited uh, capacity in our foreign ministries and our commerce ministries. At the same time, I'm not going to read out to you each of these, but if you look at the list of institutions, uh, regional, economic, and defense and strategic that India has joined to its east, it's a really long and quite uh, impressive list. So uh, we have, in 1990, Narsimha Rao enunciated, our Prime Minister enunciated the low East policy. In 1995, we joined the Asian Regional Forum. BIMSTEC was set up, SICA uh, was set up for Central Asia with not much success for us. Uh, Mekong Ganga Cooperation, East Asia Summit, we became, you know, so we are now hoping to join APEC and eventually maybe to qualify for the Trans-Pacific uh, uh, Agreement uh, as well. So a lot more business interest has also shifted into that direction. At the same time, there are the maritime and defense organizations like the Asian Regional Forum, the ASEAN uh, Defense Ministers plus eight, meetings that we participate in. There are all the naval exercises, the IONS, the IORA, etc., that we have joined. And then this long list of FTAs and, uh, you know, uh, from 1998, FTA was the first with Sri Lanka. Since then, we have FTAs with Thailand, with ASEAN, within BIMSTEC, with Singapore, with Korea, Malaysia, Japan, all of these are clearly the, the business community also will then seek to take advantage on that side. But you know, that doesn't mean that there is nothing to our West. There is, unfortunately, the West looks much more troubled when you look at it at this moment. Uh, the relationship with Pakistan, despite the hope that came when, uh, when our Prime Minister invited all the SARC uh, heads of government to his uh, swearing in ceremony did not pan out as both countries must have hoped. There are the complications of Afghanistan which may drive business away, but certainly the political establishment has to pay attention. There is our energy security in the Gulf. There is the question of expatriate Indian workers in the Gulf. There are all the terrorist organizations, whether it is ISIS, whether it is Al-Qaeda, whether it is the organizations which we believe are based in, uh, in Pakistan. And uh, I don't know exactly, but I think we have people here who later may, uh, may have something more interesting to say. But if we do get a BJP, PDP government in Kashmir after this last election, that could also change the dynamic of a number of 
disputes between our uh, countries. And finally, I would just like to uh, end by saying that this new Prime Minister uh, Modi in India, he has been the master of surprises. Uh, the invitation to the SAC heads of government were not expected. The sort of agreements and the signing of this strategic agreement with uh, Mr. Obama was not expected. So uh, maybe um, we will get another surprise. But as of now, it is as well to note that uh, government, uh, the bureaucracy, and business is looking east rather than west. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Leo, for very illuminating talk about uh, starting with China and ending with India's look east policies. I wish Mr. Modi brings a surprise which will normalize relations between India and Pakistan sooner than later. With this, we have run out of the time, but I had promised you that we will have question and answer. I'll forego my own remarks because I think I would like a time to be given to the question and answer. So let me start from there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, uh, uh, my name is Tejinder Lamba. My introduction is that my passport says I was born in Jhelum, West Pakistan. Uh, still, uh, I'll follow General Sahab. And uh, we have been talking since morning about uh, communication problems. But thanks to Mark, I don't have any communication problem. I talk every day to my dozens of uh, Pakistani friends on Facebook. It works. It, it is working very well. It never lets you down. This is one recommendation. And second, as, as, as General Saab suggested, you know, that uh, we, we need to increase our <laughs> social cultural relationships, you know, in order to affect the economy. I remember that there used to be regular Indo Pak Mushaira in, in Delhi in 70s and 80s which we have almost lost now, you know. And uh, the serious, I, I still remember a couplet, you know, from uh, the Punjabi poet, which is the, which exactly uh, describes the perception and the situation as it exists even now. The, I'm referring to the poet who, who was uh,